All right. I'm super excited to be sitting here with my fellow CK in the Bitcoin sphere, Corey Clipston. Welcome to Bitcoin Magazine Podcast. Hey, CK1. It's, uh, it's good to see you. Uh, I'm just totally fine to be uh, your wingman, CK number two. It's all good. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know about that. I think uh, Corey here has, you know, you, you've definitely blazed your way into the Bitcoin community. Uh, first with Give Bitcoin and then uh, building out the the army and the force that is Swan Bitcoin. Uh, so I, I definitely, maybe you're going to give me the name CK1, but I don't know if I'm the most CK in Bitcoin these days. Man, I, I mean, you you and the squad were uh, instrumental in in launching this because you gave me a slot on the, uh, the, the B stage, the P2P stage at 2019, uh, which was great. Like it, it let me get in front of some people, let me have something to uh, invite people to and show, you know, like maybe I wasn't just a schmo. Um, Cause I'd been lurking and like trying to hang out online and like, you know, learn as much as I could for over a year and a half before that. And uh, that was kind of like when I met a bunch of people in person for the first time. And that's when I met Jan and Parker and Stefan and a bunch of those people in person. A lot of people that have been super helpful to, uh, get and give Bitcoin and Swan off the ground. So yeah, it was uh, sorely disappointed. As you know, our, uh, our launch was planned for to coincide with uh, Bitcoin 2020. Like those exact days, we were going to launch on the 25th and the conference 26th, 27th. We ended up launching on the 30th, but we already have huge plans like well underway for uh, next April in Los Angeles, which is our headquarters. So um, really excited about that. I think we're going to be pretty much like essentially marketing your conference <laughs> for like the next nine months. Let's go. Um, yeah. That's so we're, we're psyched, too. man. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be good. Um, yeah, man. Well, a stage for Bitcoin 2021 um, definitely deserved. And again, like it's just been amazing watching you build Swan. I feel like I was there kind of like from day one, obviously just kind of watching from the sidelines, but um, it's been really impressive. And uh, before this interview, we were talking about, how how important community is and the social layer of Bitcoin is. And I think that's what we're going to focus this conversation on. Um, and last Thursday, we did a, uh, a Bitcoin pleb takeover of uh, the Drinks in Quarantine panel special on Bitcoin Magazine. And that was one of my favorite shows. There was just, it was so insightful having um, some of the, the Bitcoin plebs that are, you know, living on Twitter onto the show and, and having them all interact. It was really cool to have Hala Lanat on there. Um, but, you know, you know, before we got onto here, uh, you said you're bullish on the plebs and you're excited for what they're kind of doing in this space. Why don't you kind of give your, give your thoughts on the, the Bitcoin community and the plebs in, in particular? Well, I mean, I, I proudly am one. Um, and I feel very glad to hang out online with the plebs and, uh, and contribute to that, that community and bounce ideas off of people and, you know, be kept honest as a company that's operating in the space. Like it's, uh, I think it's, uh, plebs are pleb like people that even just take on that attitude. You don't have to hang out with other people that have that attitude, but it's basically just being like an advocate and a protector of Bitcoin and being that sort of immune system or the white blood cells, or I was even thinking, uh, this morning, just kind of thinking about, okay, if it's decentralized and there's no regulation, then what's, what's the SEC? Well, the plebs are the SEC, essentially, because they'll call out scam services and they'll dig in and, and do research and say like, hey, that's not really fair interest that this company is you know, paying out to people for the risk that they're taking on. Or, hey, that's not really the right setup for this or that. Or, you know, they, they're not disclosing bugs in time or, you know calling people out for like, Hey, you know, they could be doing privacy better or, you know, like, why can't, why can't you push the envelope and, you know, figure out a way to do that with less KYC or, you know, or and it's happened to us too, right? Like last fall before we launched give Bitcoin, you know, I, I had been using uh, give plus time lock plus educate equals Bitcoiner. And, uh, we ran up against some, some heated pleb activity on Twitter that didn't like the use of the word time lock, which is a word and it's a concept that exists outside Bitcoin, but within Bitcoin, it means something very, very specific. And it's an on-chain, you know, it's a, it's a function that exists in, in Bitcoin. And, you know, I wanted to be like bullheaded and strong there for like an hour or two, but then I was like, you know what? 
it doesn't really matter. And somebody suggested escrow and I was like, sure. Yeah, that's exactly what it is. And that's totally fine too. So we just, we just changed it. And I think that's kind of a, a good lesson for companies that want to operate in the Bitcoin space. Like reputation is everything. Play the long game. You know, you're, you're working in, with an asset that's all about low time preference exhibit low time preference for your company and for the the things that you're trying to do in the space and don't try to make a quick buck, try to add value for people that's going to last over a long period of time and build something that's sustainable. And, uh, and the plebs will carry you forward. They'll be your extended marketing team because you're doing the right thing for Bitcoiners and you're doing the right things for Bitcoin as much as you possibly can. I'm not getting audio from you, CK. Sorry. Um, I was muted. Uh, I definitely think that embracing the hardcore Bitcoin community is the best marketing a company in the space can do. Um, And the reality is that Bitcoiners are extremely loyal viral marketers because the companies that they choose to work with, uh, I think in some degree, they consider those companies to be, um, you know, almost like caretakers of the Bitcoin blockchain and have a duty to the Bitcoin blockchain. So when a company, you know, does the right things and has the right kind of moral values um, associated with how they act, you know, act, um, you know, Bitcoiners kind of have the same zeal towards those companies as they do towards Bitcoin itself. Yeah, that's absolutely right. So you you definitely have a force multiplier um, that you can bake in, but you have to pay really close attention and you have to put a lot of effort in into delivering value you know, for Bitcoin and for the community. So put out lots of really good content, people will pass it around, um, build a, a great service that is, uh, you know, lower cost than everything else doing what you do and people will share it and they'll share it aggressively and they'll push it on people. Um, and so you may be able to, uh, you know, spend less, which is really important in Bitcoin because it's super difficult to find uh, investor dollars for uh, Bitcoin startups because you're not creating money out of thin air like, uh, like cryptos. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, let's kind of dig into that because I mean, one of the things I was most impressed about watching Swan is how quickly you bootstrapped community around um, the company and how quickly you started building out, uh, you know, a group of, you know, diehard Swan advocates and even some of the most prominent Bitcoiners, you know, repping the brand hardcore. We got got a couple of new ones to add since the last time you and I talked. Uh, Gigi came on board a few weeks back, so that's been awesome to have him sitting in team meetings and contributing. He's uh, spectacularly skilled in the things that he does, and I'm not going to uh, dox him by saying what he's good at, but it's been very helpful to have his perspective and to have him as an advisor and hopefully a future team member, so that's been great. He's a beast. Um, He's so cool. And, uh, and then we also just, uh, we just added Preston Pish as an advisor. So he should be showing up on more of our shows and, and hopefully we'll be able to get some leverage out of, uh, of, you know, pretty large and prominent voice. That's a crossover voice. There aren't many of those. Um, so we kind of, we kind of see people like him and Max Kaiser, who's, you know, an advisor, investor, and strong advocate for Swan, uh, refers a ton of people to us as uh as very very special because they have those audiences that cross over and pull new people in so i mean how have you kind of like built value and rapport uh i mean amongst you know kind of big names like that but also just the the greater bitcoin community like uh, you know what what is important in in actually doing that i think it's pretty much just going on podcasts and talking about bitcoin (laughs) Really? I mean, I think that's a big part of it. I think it's just, you know, being, uh, you know, truthful and earnest and, and having a good plan and coming up with a good product and, you know, creating like, I mean, this thing built in concentric circles, you know, first there were three of us and then there were like six and, you know, we, we've done a pretty good job of hiring and, and we realized, you know, fairly quickly that you were better off just hiring Bitcoiners off of Twitter than, uh, than anyone else with a specialized skill that you might think you needed for your tech startup, but who were not Bitcoiners because so much is lost in translation and there's so much less effort put in because they don't actually care. Um, so if you can get a Bitcoiner, I mean, we, we've happened to get great Bitcoiners in each role that I would have hired anyway without Bitcoin expertise. But, um, you know, generally speaking, I think you're, uh, 
Bitcoin understanding and, and caring about it is so much more important than maybe being like the absolute best in your particular function when you're working on a Bitcoin company. Yeah, I totally agree. And I, I think that's a big part of our hire, hiring philosophy at Bitcoin Magazine too. And uh, I think the fact that you guys came to that realization that, you know, hire Bitcoiners uh, so quickly and early on saved you a lot of money and headache. And I'm sure a lot of other Bitcoin entrepreneurs will um, second that. But uh, it definitely was a painful process for BTC Inc. Um, you know, not necessarily always hiring Bitcoiners. And uh, we've had to learn that that lesson. And uh, now, obvious, you know, we, we're only going for Bitcoiners. And it really allows you to run leaner because Bitcoiners are obsessed with Bitcoin and they just put hours yeah. in because they're obsessed with Bitcoin. Right. And it's, it's, it's not even the hours spent grinding at a laptop. It's like, you know, if you're out with friends or you're, you know, on your own time or whatever, you're probably just thinking about Bitcoin and thinking about connections and thinking about guests and thinking about like who you can get to and who can help you get this done or that done. You know, we're all kind of the same way. Like, you know, Brady and Jan and I, we have families, but you know, we probably on occasion, our minds stray back to Bitcoin, even when we're hanging out with our kids or whatever. And, you know, you end up having a good idea that you jot down in Slack or share the next day on a meeting or whatever. Um, and you wouldn't get that from somebody that didn't care about it. They'd punch in, they'd go nine to five and they'd be done with it. And, you know, that's what it's been like for me, um, you know, pre Bitcoin working on SaaS companies and marketplaces. And, you know, it, it was rare that you'd find companies where people were truly obsessed with the mission of what they were actually doing. And when you did find it, you know, those were the ones you wanted to hang out on. You know, that was, that was the projects that I was really attracted to and wanted to work more on, you know, as a consultant or advisor or occasional, you know, employee or contract worker or whatever. I'd always try to get down with the ones on a mission. And, you know, and when the mission gets stripped away and you realize that it's bullshit, which does happen sometimes too, then it's just like an immediate turn off and you just can't, can't mess with them anymore. Um, you know, so I think it's really important to actually believe it and actually dig in really deep and make sure that the people you're working with are actually there for the right reasons and, and are really down for the cause. So, you know, one of the ways we've been able to do that is by bringing people on as like advisors or contractors first and get, get an opportunity to work with them for a few months before bringing them on as full-time people. Yeah. Yeah, I and mean, I'm, I'm glad that that's worked out, but also allowed a lot of great Bitcoiners to get a shot to work for Bitcoin. I feel like you've allowed a lot of people to work for Bitcoin, and uh, it's definitely cool to help a Bitcoiner go from not working for Bitcoin to working for Bitcoin. Um, kind of want to pivot the conversation a little bit. Um, you know, one of the things that you know is that, you know, Bitcoiners are, you know, really, you know, they're, they're very zealous about Bitcoin and spend a lot of time thinking and working. And a lot of times, you know, Bitcoiners will get called, you know, part of a cult or like a religion. Uh, I'm, I have pretty strong opinions and feelings about, uh, you know, that phrasing and uh, that idea in general. And I know you do too. Um, I know you, you actually wrote a, you wrote a, uh, uh, an essay kind of about this, uh, about kind of like the, the minimum amount of Bitcoiners we need to bring on to make Bitcoin a standard. Uh, can, can you talk a yeah. little bit about your thinking around this topic? Sure. Well, it, it is kind of two separate things, but they're not totally unrelated. I was talking uh, in 10 million Bitcoiners, the intransigent minority was a lot more about just like the number of people that need to own a decent chunk of Bitcoin and care about it, um, to kind of flip the system or just to make sure that Bitcoin will not go through, uh, you know, all on and off ramps shut off by the U S government or something like that, um, where you'd have enough strength in the population to, you know, flood town hall meetings and make it difficult for reps to get reelected re and things like that. Um, and, and that number in complex systems, societies, whatever is generally like three and a half to 4%. And so that's just kind of the math that we came up with is, you know, we think we need about 10 million Bitcoiners in the U S to stop the most powerful government and the money printing machine that, <laughs> that's uh, running the whole global system uh, from clamping down on Bitcoin in a way that could make it really difficult for people for, you know, a, a decade or two or more or whatever it is. It wouldn't kill Bitcoin. It may even, you know, it, it all it would do is make it very difficult for people like me. So it's kind of selfish. Uh, I want to be able to enjoy the fruits of a bright orange future as soon as possible. Um, and for all the people that I care about and love. And, you know, I think there is a bit of a moral imperative there too, because, you know, as Andreas has said many times, you know, if you can prevent even one uh, episode of hyperinflation in any country in the world, then basically almost anything that you can do for Bitcoin is worth it. 
Um, so I, I do see it kind of in those terms as well. Like you want to make this thing happen as soon as possible. And I don't buy the argument that like, just because it's inevitable, it doesn't matter if it happens in five years or 50 years. Like, no, I want it to happen in five years or 10 years, like as soon as possible. Um, you know, and then on the, on the religion side of things or the, you know, the zealotry or whatever, you know, I, I think it's obvious that people that are into Bitcoin are, uh, uh often very into Bitcoin. Uh, I've often used the uh, kind of the uh, the line that the people that you knew that were into CrossFit like 10 years ago, like the worst ones, the most evangelical, the most paleo, this, that, brain food, whatever, uh, you know, Bitcoiners are probably 10 times worse than them. And there's probably 10 times more of them. <laughs> so if you want to... The barrier to entry is much lower for Bitcoin. It's just true, some sad. True, true, true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I think that creates a really special opportunity for, for people to be part of something. Um, it's a huge tent, you know, Bitcoin's a huge tent. And then on the, on the kind of religious side of things, you know, I think uh, a friar, a man of the orange cloth is the one who kind of laid out the path for, uh, for DCA businesses and created the thesis, you know, Friar Haas. So shout out to Friar um, Haas McCook, if you have not heard of him before. Um, a legend. Look him Legend up. indeed. But yeah, I think it was, you know, he was talking about it a lot and you had, uh, you know, pioneers like Alex uh, Svetsky getting started with a, a DCA product, which was kind of the evolution of, of what had initially been kind of like a, a roundup, you know, change product down in Australia. So he got live with that. Um, and we had built, we had built recurring purchases for yourself into give Bitcoin when it first launched. Uh, you could also just, start stacking for yourself and set up recurring purchase. So it was always in there. And then it was just kind of a decision in December um, to strip it out and give it its own, its own product. I just didn't think it belonged underneath give Bitcoin. Nobody was going to find it and it didn't have sexy branding. And, you know, there's so many more things you can do with a, a swan that might be a superhero or might be goofy or might talk or might not. I don't know. It's kind of like this character that you can play with. So we're having a lot of fun with the brand and we think it's a lot better for, uh, for that product. Yeah, but I guess on the idea of like, I guess Bitcoin as a religion, like I, I, I think Bitcoin's a values delivery system, right? So obviously it's a, it's a money layer for the internet and a value delivery system in terms of actual value, like real buying power. But I also think it delivers values like human action uh, and it, by, by instilling specific kind of human action and, and uh, desires within people who adopt it. Um, so that's kind of like my framework of seeing why people have such strong, you know, feelings towards Bitcoin, especially those who really adopt it. Um, do you kind of have thoughts about Bitcoin more deeply in, in that context? Yeah, no, I, I absolutely agree that, uh, you know, Bitcoin does seem to make better people <laughs> out of the people that get into it. Uh you know, and, and I think a lot of times when people have found something that they feel like is making them a better person or that it is just making them think better thoughts or make them feel good about themselves or whatever, they want other people to feel that too. So they get pretty evangelical about it and they're eager to spread that uh, because of what they've seen it do for themselves. So yeah, 100%. I think that's the root of it. I think that's why you see things like GG writing 21 lessons or people saying like, you know, you don't change Bitcoin, Bitcoin changes you. Um, you know, I absolutely think that's what's going on. And I think what we're going to see over the next decade or two is so many philosophical, sociological, political, economic arguments that appear to have two sides where you could kind of like flip a coin or like choose a side and you'd be justified in choosing either one, or at least you wouldn't have incontrovertible evidence that your side was right versus the other side. A lot of those arguments are just getting settled by reality. You know, you're not going to be able to have that argument about like the earth is flat, the earth is round, because at some point there was just proof that the earth was round. And at some point in the not too distant future, you're just not going to be able to argue for socialism, communism against capitalism, let's say, a pure non-crony fiat capitalism, um, or just like liberal laissez-faire values. You know, I think it's Bitcoin is going to make it very clear by its very existence and by what it does to the world and society globally and all of our global economy that, uh, you know, frankly, the, the ideas of the French revolution and then, you know, much better executed 
in the uh, in the, the by the framers in in the American Constitution uh, got so much of it right, and you know they were they all knew that this thing was going to go sideways if you let the banks print the money and have control over the money supply, and that's the one thing that's really broken in the system for the last hundred years. Um, but I think it'll be it'll be really interesting to see the combination of you know rights of the individual personal responsibility and hard money and how that will just lay waste to so many counter arguments over the next few decades. Yeah, it really is kind of crazy to, when you go back and see how much Thomas Jefferson wrote about gold and hard money as a standard and in sovereignty over money. And even, you know, the chant of the revolutionaries was no taxation without representation. It kind of comes, always comes back to, uh, a fair value system. And it's just funny nowadays when you look at activists on the street, they hardly ever talk about the money. They talk about everything else. And th they often, you know, make moral arguments and point fingers. And just like you said, a, a lot of those kind of like red team, blue team, uh, you know, I'm good, you're bad uh, arguments are, are, are going to start, you know, you know, just getting disintegrated by, by reality. Yeah, I think that's right. I think what you'll find is, you know, a lot of the people on the right and the left uh, often have identified real problems uh, and they just typically have the wrong solution because they just are, you know, not understanding what's what's deeper. Uh, and I'm I'm hopeful that the spread of Bitcoin will make us realize that the left and the right are not actually on a spectrum, that they're actually on a circle and then you'll meet at Bitcoin <laughs> if, you, if you go far enough. Um, yeah, we'll I can see. tell you've been talking to Gigi. Uh, I don't know if you said that one. It's probably the third or fourth time I've dropped the circle analogy. But yeah, it, it is certain that uh, that guy has some deep thoughts uh, and he spends a lot of time getting real deep. But, uh, you know, he's got he's got company creeping up on him with uh, with Breedlove lately. Uh, Robert dropped a new yeah. piece uh, yesterday, which I'm excited to uh, about. I'm about halfway listening to it on uh, on Pocket. And I think I'm just going to wait for Guy to finish reading it. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think guys dropping a couple, uh, a two parts on that. Breedlove, like, what Breedlove just does more than anyone else is just super, super in depth, super detailed pieces. Um, I don't know, I don't know how he writes these these freaking novels. Listen, man, it's it's quite the service, and I think it'll be these will be foundational texts when people are looking back at the uh, the anthropology of Bitcoin in a few hundred years. Selfishly, might, one of the reasons why I try to make as much content as possible is so I can just have all this evidence of, hey, I was there. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's fun. It's fun. It is, it is a legacy. And, you know, I think uh, it's good for yourself, too, to just have uh, kind of a record of what you were thinking, because I'm sure there are some things that we are, uh, you know, staunch believers of today that will seem a little bit anachronistic at some point as Bitcoin takes its turns over the years. Um, you know, I like to think that we've gotten the most important things right. And uh, certainly some people have had more foresight than others, you know, and we kind of know who those people are over the last eight, nine years. But, um, you know, I'm sure there are there are, are things that will change in the zeitgeist around Bitcoin over time, too. And it'll just be fun to look 100%. back and think what you thought back then. Yeah, 100 percent. I mean, Bitcoin is is continuously changing and kind of discussing like something that both me and you, I think, think about a lot is is like the like what the transition process from where we are now to onboarding into bitcoin um i call it hyper bitcoinization personally i think it's a hyper bitcoinization is the process not the end result um but that's more semantics um like obviously swan's goal and purpose is to onboard people into satoshis um mm -hmm. can you talk a little bit about like just what you think about that transition process. I know you want to get there as fast as possible. I, I, like, yeah. Is it going to be a smooth process? It can be painful. Like what's your vision there? Uh, I mean, I think we've gotten a lot of people in already just from a totally standing start. Um, we haven't run user surveys yet, but just by the, you know, the kinds of questions that we get in support, I would guess over half of our users were the first time that they've ever bought Bitcoin, which is pretty awesome. Um, I definitely wouldn't have thought on these volumes that it would be that high, but I do think that's kind of what's going on. Um, 
You know, the other thing I think that we have a real responsibility to do, and we've been putting out a lot more content and, you know, frequently asked question entries and things like that. And we're going to do more videos, et cetera, on just teaching people about self-custody. Um, Cause we are, you know, we're the best service when people are doing all three steps of what Swan is, which is, you know, automatic withdrawal from a bank account, automatic purchase of Bitcoin and automatic withdrawal to self-custody. Um, but that requires people to be comfortable with self-custody and that, that can be a, you know, hardware wallet, but it can also be, you know, us setting people up with, uh, you know, with Unchained or Casa or something like that and getting them set up with multi-sig or, or something like that. Um, so I think there are a few different ways to get at that. And, and we're spending a lot of time now just kind of trying to figure out how to get uh, everybody to shift their thinking in that direction, unless you're really, you know, uh, you know, grandpa or grandma or, or somebody that's just like totally technically inept. Um, and those people, we obviously custody for free. In terms of like the mental shift, we have to shift people's minds from a, you know, get taken care of mindset to take care of myself mindset. And I think that that's a big differentiator between self custody and wanting to have your money in a bank account. Yeah. Um, you know, how much of that is education versus like people actually need to change, change their attitude? Well, I think Bitcoin and going down the rabbit hole and reading all of the materials around Bitcoin, because it, it opens up a different, a different lens into, you know, philosophy and economics and history and all kinds of other things. If you get into Bitcoin, you start getting interested into, in, in a lot of different slices on these other aspects of the social and, and, you know, economic sciences that uh, are a little bit more in line with, with Bitcoin thinking. And, and a lot of those tend toward making you want to take personal responsibility. It's kind of how I see it. Responsibility for your decisions, not believing in just like random luck, um, you know, preparation, long-term thinking, a lot of these different things just become kind of uh, part of the fabric of a Bitcoiner over time. Do you think that anyone that holds Bitcoin eventually will like have the values of Bitcoin instilled on them or is it, do the values kind of only attach to a, a intransigent minority? Neither. So it's not everybody, but I don't think it'll be like a tiny minority either. Um, I think it does and everything's on a scale, right? Like, so some people will go further down the rabbit hole uh, and some people will go less, but just broadly it'll shift people more toward a Bitcoin frame of reference. So you'll just kind of anchor on those things and they'll be more widespread in society and you'll see higher quality. You'll see a lot of the stuff uh, from the middle chapters of the Bitcoin standard without some of the invective. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I don't know how I feel about the pop culture opinions by Saifedean, but pretty much everything else in the standard I 100% jive with. Um, kind of on the tip of you know, people holding Bitcoin themselves, part of that is, you know, part of the features of holding Bitcoin by yourself in, in, in a self-custody manner is it really kind of gives you a, the ability to move around the globe like never before. Like you, if all your values in Bitcoin, you know, you could rather trivially, you know, move across the world and keep all your value with you. Have you thought about the second and third order effects of that kind of reality um, you know, coming to be? Yeah, I mean, quite a lot. I, I often think a little bit more about the money moving around the globe than the people. I think, um, you know, on the people side, uh, you know, obviously it's a check on tyranny if your people can keep all or most of their value or a decent amount of value and be able to exit, not just with their person and what's in their brain, but, you know, also the money that's in their brain or the money that's somehow, you know, sequestered and in a way that they can uh, they can retrieve it outside of uh, you know the tyrannical region that they're living in. Um, so I think that's super important, and it's a check on on tyranny around the world. Um, it's also a check on money printing. Obviously, um, you know if Bitcoin is there as an out for the populace, then you can't really go too nuts. And I think we'll see that play out a lot more over time. Um, but you know broadly. You know, I think that's something that is uh, better explained by people living under regimes like that or who uh, actually escape regimes like that. So, 
you know, I was talking to uh, El Sultan from Venezuela this morning and just talking about, you know, how it's going on the ground there and just kind of learning a little bit about what he's working on. Uh, and then, you know, that's a very different experience from the reasons that I might buy Bitcoin here, which is largely, you know, number go up with, you know, some hopes and dreams for a better world sprinkled in, but it's, it's not a, it's not such a mandate the way it might be for, for someone in, in a, a country with a really poor currency. Um, or you've got, you know, my co-founder Jan Pritzker, who uh, left the Soviet Union in, you know, late 80s and they left with like $100 worth of rubles or something like that. Or it was $100 in cat, uh, of US dollars, but it was the most they could bring out. Um, and it may not have even been cash. I think they were allowed to leave with $100 worth of goods. I think that's the story. Um, so that's basically what everybody did. They'd, they'd figure out where they were going and they'd try to get intel from somebody on the ground where they were going as to what they should buy that they could sell on the street to start building their economic fortune in a new country. And I think they went to Italy and somebody had told them that it was thermometers. And so they spent their hundred dollars on thermometers and showed up with a bunch, like a suitcase full of thermometers to get back on their feet. <laughs> and the intel was bad and nobody wanted the thermometers. <laughs> So I mean, yeah, it would have been much better to leave with uh, with your seed phrase in your head. Yeah, I mean it, it's absolutely badass. Like thinking of those immigrants grinding through and making it work, uh, and it's something that I feel like a lot of Americans don't appreciate that that's reality. Especially second, third generation Americans that one they are less attached to the person that came here, but second they've been living you know, in a, the land of, can, you know, where they are benefiting from the Cantillon effect of USD. Um, and they just don't understand, you know, currency controls, uh, illiquid currency, all that kind of stuff uh, really um, hasn't affected them. But with that being said, in the sovereign individual, you know, the authors often talk about how um, very industrialized, uh, you know, nations like the US and Europe uh, potentially could be the you know, the bad guys in the future in terms of uh, a Bitcoin world or a world where there's sovereign currency, uh, completely digital currency that's unseizable. Those jurisdictions are going to be the ones that tax you the heaviest and um, are, uh, are the most imposing. Uh, have you kind of thought about like what, you know, how obviously Bitcoin changes the game, but have you thought about like how that actually affects the U.S. and other kind of like industrialized countries? Yeah, I mean, I think it's a it's a very possible outcome that Bitcoin gets adopted by, you know, Iran, North Korea, Iran, and, and a bunch of other countries that the U.S. government considers unsavory um, for good or bad reasons. And, and, you know, we end up with central bank digital currencies of some kind here where they are, you know, doling out UBI into uh, people's wallets, but uh, have the ability to shut literally anybody off from the system at any time and have total surveillance and censorship and all kinds of horrible enslaving technologies at their disposal. And I think that is the direction that we're headed. I mean, a cashless society is, uh, is a freedomless society. And I think that's where we're headed, if not for Bitcoin. So, you know, I think it would be a disaster on a global scale for the US to end up being the purveyor of the really scary dystopian, you know, surveillance slavery model, which will be enabled by, you know, the Libras or the CBDCs of the world. And I don't want to see that happen. Um, so I think, uh, you know, it's incumbent upon people that are in a position to fight the good fight and re recruit people to the, uh, to the orange team uh, to try to make orange team as big as possible. So that's, really what I'm working on every day is trying to get as many people in the U S as possible to become Bitcoiners and to give a shit and to understand and, and just go down the rabbit hole and start reading all this stuff. Like we don't have to put out all of the content, just a tiny little bit and do our part to give people skin in the game so that they're buying some and accumulating and caring and watching and paying attention and having that selective perception that comes when you're on the internet and you see the word Bitcoiner post from somebody that you saw on a podcast and you decide to read that and you get further and further sucked in and that's going to be good for the world. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's beautiful and, and really kind of like the most pragmatic way to kind of go about, uh, you know, thinking about it, right. It doesn't matter if it's good or bad for the U S but 
Bitcoin's good for the world and we might as well get as many Americans on board as possible. Yeah. But I will, I mean, I will say like, I'm very sympathetic to the idea that already, uh, again, people around the world in many, many countries see the U S as, uh, you know, a negative for the globe. And they often think it's because of some sort of shady, like CIA type thing or, you know, new world order collusion, Bilderberg, Illuminati, whatever. And, it actually is way, way simpler than that and way more obvious than that. And it's that we're all just living in this matrix created by the U S having the global reserve currency and not managing it. Well, essentially just absolutely manipulating it. Cause as you pointed out, you know, there may be a Cantillon effect for bankers over the middle class in the U S but there's also a Cantillon effect for everyone in the U S over people in other countries because we get the benefit of the printed dollars first in so many different ways. And so you have a leg up here that's not just about us being, you know, geopolitically well situated from sea to shining sea with no, you know, angry neighbors or having, uh, you know, great farmland, kind of all the Stratford, George Freeman, Peter Zion things like those are all true. But it's also just this accident of history that post World War II, we had all the cards and basically just hammered everybody into place and said like, this is the way it's going to be. And then pulled a little magic trick in, in 71 with the petrodollar and have perpetuated the system by which we essentially just get to borrow for free and, and steal, you know, via, via inflation of the dollar from everyone else around the world. Cause the entire system is underpinned by the dollar. So, you know, I, friends of mine in you know Venezuela or Turkey or you know anywhere else around the world might be kind of upset at the advantage that we've just been gifted or granted and and they're right um, but they almost never actually identify where that power comes from so obviously both you and I believe that Bitcoin solves this and Bitcoin can in, can bring on a better world uh, just to close the show, can you kind of describe the world that you think Bitcoin can enable and, you know, why you're working so hard to bring that world into existence? Yeah, I mean, it's not, it's not that complex because I think, I don't think you can, you can't be right about all of the specifics, but I think what you can be right about is a larger global playing field for the marketplace uh, will create more efficiencies and create more opportunity for for people that are down and, and let you know people that have really good ideas find capital and find resources a lot faster and remove friction remove regulation and and just be able to essentially usher in a much more prosperous much more sane much less cyclically driven uh, period of growth you know like if the if the Bella Polk had lasted more than 30 or 40 years and had lasted like a few hundred years, uh, what could we achieve? Uh, and that's what I think, that's what I think will be ushered in and we'll see the start of it, you know, over the next few decades as Bitcoinization, I just leave off the age, it doesn't really matter as Bitcoinization starts to take hold and, and more and more people have that way of, uh, you know, pricing goods and services around the globe, uh, in whatever currency locally if they want to, but also in Bitcoin and then being able to transact with anyone else around the globe, uh, you know, near instantly and, uh, and very inexpensively compared to, uh, today, I think will be, uh, just fascinating to watch and will unlock an incredible, uh, period of, of human development and growth and pulling people out of poverty and greater cooperation and, you know, I, I often just like bring up the example of, you know, the, one of the longest standing empires that ever existed, uh, never fought a war, which was the Phoenician Empire, which is, you know, the Eastern Mediterranean. And I don't think it's an accident that that's the longest standing culture. And it's where, you know, two of the touchstone thinkers of this space, you know, Taleb and, and Saifedean, you know, come from that region. And it's just kind of like these conversations that we think are super novel are the kinds of things that their grandparents talk to them about every day. And they just kind of like mix it with some of their professional interests and put a book about it. But it's the same kind of thing that I hear from my wife and her family all the time. It's just information that's handed down, you know, grandma to, to granddaughter, to son, to, to brother. And that's just kind of how that region works is a lot of this. And the Phoenician empire was a commercial empire and it was all about just making trade as free as possible and having contracts be, 
you know, be uh, set in stone as much as possible and, and trying to stay out of wars and understanding that you didn't care if people had different religions, if you could trade with them, you know, and you had, you had money that, that both sides were willing to accept for goods and services, then you could live in peace. And, uh, and I'm just kind of thinking that uh, Bitcoin can bring about sort of like a global Phoenician empire uh, 3,000 years later. That's awesome. That's probably uh, one of the best ways you could uh, close out a show. Corey, for those who want to learn more about you and Swan Bitcoin, where can they find you? Well, I'm going to shill a new podcast, which I'm recording episode two of later today. Um, so as you know, we have the Swan Signal podcast, which is every Wednesday. Uh, you can find all the stuff about our, our shows show. on swanbitcoin.com. Um, swansignalpodcast.com is that one. We also just started a, a new one called Ugly Duckling in the Bright Orange Future, which uh, sounds like a 90s band. And it's, uh, it's actually myself and, uh, and my brother, my brother Matt are the hosts of the show and sometimes it's just us and sometimes we'll have guests, but we talk about uh, basically like culture and Gen X eighties and nineties and kind of the milieu from which uh, Bitcoin sprung with the cypherpunks, you know, starting their mailing list in the early nineties and snow crash coming out in 93 and some of that, you know, Seattle and grunge and et cetera. So I think it's, it's, it's going to be kind of fun. I'm definitely treating him as like a representative of the 99% that are not Bitcoiners, but are sort of Bitcoin interested. Um, and so I think it's, uh, it's off to a good start and we're really excited about that. So look out for, uh, ugly duckling is also on the youtube.com slash swan Bitcoin and, uh, check out some of those episodes as we post them. Um, Who's the ugly Corey, duckling? Well, the, it's actually uh, swan is the ugly duckling. Cause you know, it's a, a young ugly duckling is, is a swan. And then, uh, bright orange future is where we're headed with, uh, with Bitcoin. We didn't want to have Bitcoin in the title. So we just decided to use something kind of abstract. But, uh, you know, since my brother also has like a, a bit of a ginger, I guess he could be the bright orange future. And I'm happy to be the ugly duckling if, if you needed to say it that way. No, nah, nah. That'd be like Darius Rucker from Hootie just saying like, I'm not Hootie. It's like, dude, you're Hootie. <laughs> like, don't, call your, don't call your hand Hootie and the blowfish if you don't want to be called Hootie. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Um, cool, Corey. And uh, so other than the podcast, uh, I guess you want to plug your Twitter and stuff like that? Uh, Corey Clipston on Twitter. It's me, but, uh, Swan Bitcoin. I'm on the handle as much as anybody else. Uh, you can always blame one of me, Brecky, Brady, or Jan. If there's a bad tweet from the handle, it was one of us. <laughs> All right. So I should but, uh, just tag everyone every time and be like, yeah, you know, you know, what's up with that? Get tweet? it together. <laughs> get it together. Exactly. Um, but yeah, no, I think, uh, also shout out to, uh, to Nick, my, my former boss, who I think is interning with you guys now. Um, that's, that's a, a running, step down. It's a running joke on Twitter that, uh, Nick unseated me as CEO, but, uh, you know, happy to see him land well with, uh, uh, one of our brothers in arms, Bitcoin magazine team. Thank you. Yeah. He is a, he's a blessing. So glad that we could take him off your shoulders. Um, but yeah, so, Hey, Corey, thanks again for coming on. It was a fun conversation. I think we, we got into a lot of, a lot of fun topics here. So Bitcoiners, uh, if you like this content, make sure to rate and review the show. Uh, make sure to check out our other great shows, FedWatch, Bitcoin in Asia, and a new one uh, starring Aaron Van Wordham, uh, which should be dropping this week. Uh, so subscribe to Bitcoin Magazine. Awesome. Thanks, CK. Thank you.